chatting about Arsenal and Doncaster Rovers because the two share the same colours, red and white, even though I'm wearing the away kit today. But we've got an incredible history between us back in the early days of football and a couple of recent fixtures. And who better to speak about Arsenal and Donny Rovers with than with the guy who's given fans a voice since just a few years ago. In just a few years of space, he's given fans a voice and he's given fans a time to come back into the game and be just as important as the players, the managers, the backroom staff and the boardroom. It's the one and only Robbie from AFTV. Robbie, how are you doing, mate? Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> I love that intro. That was a nice intro. Thank you very much. Um, no, doing well. Of course, the main focus of today is talking about the history of Arsenal and Doncaster Rovers, talking about the rep the direction of each club where we're going uh we're gonna get started straight away and speak about previous occasions now robbie we're gonna take a trip down memory lane here because i've got two previous occasions um where arsenal and rovers have met one where donks rovers could have got something we could hold up we could have held our heads high after that game and another one which took it to penalties so uh, this is going to be a trip down memory lane. He's at the side of me right now. Um, we've got a trip down memory lane right now. So uh, let's talk about this fixture. Let's see if you can uh, remember this one. 1-0 one cup match just a few years ago. Remember that? Yeah, yeah I remember that. Was, um, you gave us a good game. Yeah. Gave us a very, I mean, it was a much changed Arsenal. played um, a lot of the youngsters. But still, you know, um, Doncaster really, really... Gave us a good run for our money on that day. So, yeah, I do remember that game. Yeah, it was definitely uh, a close one. And for those of you who need a reminder, and this is how much the squads have changed since that day. Let's talk about the lineup. So, and this is going to, again, this is going to be a trip down memory lane for all of us. So, let's have a look at these lineups. So, this was the Carabao Cup match 1 0 win for Arsenal. So, the team lineup was a 3 4 2 1. And it started for Arsenal with David Ospina in goal. See if you can remember that one. Um, back three of Callum Chambers, Pierre Mertesacker and Rob Holding. So, yeah, two players are still there. One's retired now. Uh, Reese Nelson on the right. Maitland Niles on the left. El Nenny and Wilshire in the midfield. And then we had Giroud up front. And behind Giroud, Theo Walcott and Alexis Sanchez. Mm, not a lot of players out of that lineup that are still there. A um, couple of young players there that kind of gone on to become, you know, not fully established players yet, but um, like Ainsley Maitland-Niles, you know, who's um, playing quite a lot in the first team now. Uh, Rob Holding has had a lot of games and Callum Chambers was having a lot of games, but um, he's been injured for quite a long time now. He's just making his way back. So, but apart from that, yeah, the, uh, El Nenny's still there. But the majority of that team, gone. <laughs> There's been a lot of wholesale changes since then. And, and you've got to look at the subs bench as well. Alex Iwobi, Nacho Monreal, Tuba Akpom, Josh De Silva, or Jay De Silva, it just has Jay De Silva, uh, Matt Macy, Eddie Nketiah and Joe Willock. So still a few players there, but the likes of Iwobi, Monreal, Akpom, who's joined Middlesbrough recently, you know, a lot's gone from that bench as well. The only players left off of that bench were the last three you named, Willock, um, the three youngsters, Willock and uh, who was the other two you named? Uh, Inketia and Macy. Inketia and Macy, yeah. Macy's still here as well, backup goalkeeper. So some of those youngsters are still here. Um, and Arsenal, you know, we've got a great tradition of bringing through young players. And unlike a lot of other Premier League teams, we actually play them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so they actually do get a chance. You know, when you come through the Arsenal Academy, you do actually have a decent chance of making it into the, um, you know, if you're good enough, making it all the way to play, um, which is not the case with a lot of other Premier League teams. So you can see from that, as you said, that lineup, there's still a few players there that are knocking on the door at Arsenal. Yeah, I definitely think there's a there's a few youngsters like the Willocks and Katias that are knocking on the door to take over in the first team in the future, maybe. Uh, all you Doncaster fans out there are probably thinking, what was the team for us back then? Well, uh, I've got that written down as well. Uh, we were playing a 4-5-1 because we were under the management of Darren Ferguson at the time. Uh, Lawler in goal, of course he's out on loan at the minute. Uh, back five, Tommy Rowe and Matty Blair on the, the right and left. Mason Butler and right in the middle of centre-backs. Uh, Congolo, of course, on loan from Man City at that point. Ben Whiteman, Jordan Houghton, James Coffinger, who's in his last season now after 
13, 14 years at the club, and Alfie May up front, and then we had on the bench Alcock, Marquise, Williams, Morosi, Mandeville, Toffolo, and Garrett. So a lot of players that are not there anymore. Uh, now this one will really take you back, Robbie. This is Donny versus Arsenal, 21st December 2005. A lot of players not there anymore. Arsenal won 3-1 on penalties, 1-1 at, at uh, when we got into the extra time. Uh, this will take you back. So the Arsenal lineup was Almunia in goal, uh, a centre back three of Pascal Saigan, Johan Doidrum, Philippe Senderos, um, a midfield of Emmanuel Abue, Gilberto Silva, Alexander Hleb, Alex Song, and then we had a midfield slash forward uh, of Quincy Owosu Abayi. And then up front, Arturo Lupoli and Robin Van Persie. And then uh, on the bench, Mark Porn, uh, Kara Gilbert, Seb Larson, Fabrice Muamba, and Nicholas Bentner. So a lot of changes between 2005 and now. One of those players still there. And um, remember, Fabrice Muamba, he, he, uh, he was the one who got that heart attack that time playing football. Um, but yeah, not one of those players. See, see, that just shows you the turnover of football. That the shows you that how short careers are for footballers. You know what I mean? They they don't have a, you know what I mean? They have to really seize their opportunity when they get there because you're not there for that long. You know, so um, and that shows it. You know, but um, yeah, that was quite a strong team. Apart from at the back, I remember Manuel Almunia <laughs> and Pascal Segan. Oh gosh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> Could you imagine DT's reaction to that team? It was a twenty. Could you imagine DT's reaction to a 2020 version of that team? Oh gosh! But to, having said that, we uh, we you know um, that team did also have some good players in there as well. So um, it was a bit of a mix. Uh, but yeah, um, I, I don't remember the game. I don't remember the game in 2005 um, that vividly. But obviously, I remember all those players. So and I remember that team, that particular team. So yeah, I mean, I mean, time's gone by so fast since that. Um, I mean, you guys out there who are Donny fans are probably think what was the team for us on that day? Like we said with the previous game, uh, we had uh, Jan Boots uh, in goal. I'm not sure how it's pronounced. <laughs> it's Danish, so my pronunciation is horrible. Um, we've got a defence of Nick Fenton, Sean McDade, Steve Roberts, and Steve Foster. Uh, in the midfield, Michael McIndoe, who was a legendary player for us. Ricky Ravenhill, of course his son's in the academy now uh, with Liam Ravenhill. Uh, Sean Thornton and James Coppinger, still in the team. Um, he's been at the club for so long, then up front there was Guy and Paul Heffernan. And then uh, on the bench we had Tony Nielsen, Sam OG, Paul Green, Leo Fortune West and Neil Roberts. So again, a big change to the team apart from James Coppinger. And, to be fair, that's something I wanted to discuss your thoughts on. I mean, James Coppinger, it's his last season at Rovers. Uh, he's played at the club for 13, 14, 15 years. Uh, and he's been at the club for so long. I mean, you know, this is his last season. If we do get promoted, it'll end on a high. I mean, 14 years at one club is very unheard of in the modern day of football. Yeah, totally unheard of. <laughs> I mean, um, you don't really get any players, well, especially up in the Premier League nowadays, that will stay at one club for that long. Um, the turnover of players is just so much. So um, I can't think of any player. Um, maybe I don't think who's a, at our club. There's, there's I can't think of any player that's been there. there we had Martinez, Emmy Martinez, who who left the other day. Um, actually, for Villa, he'd been there for just over ten years. And I think Bellerin has been there for about either I think it's about nine years. He's been there quite a long time, but. Most players nowadays, you know, the way transfers are and stuff like that, and the way football clubs operate, I mean, you don't really care. You know, as soon as you start underperforming at the Premier League level, they'll bring someone else in to replace you. That's how it is. It's like a dog eat dog sort of thing. So um, you don't really see players last that long. I think um, thinking with other clubs, um, maybe, what's his name at West Ham? Well, he's been there for ages. Mark he's Noble. Been, Mark Noble, yeah, he's been there since he's a kid. So he's probably been there about that length of time or longer. Mm. But yeah, but most players, that loyalty is no longer there. Not just from the players, but from the clubs either. And another player that seems to be doing very well um, in the Bristol Rovers game, even though he didn't score, but the Charlton game, he scored an absolutely brilliant solo effort. 
It's your youngster, Tyrese John Jules. Forget Dominic Calvert Lewin and DCL, it's TJJ. John Jules is a very good player. Um, you know, you've you've got a very good player on loan. Um, he in the youth ranks at Arsenal, he's a regular goal scorer, prolific. Um really thought of highly by the um coaches at the under 23 level and um they wanted him to go and get a lot of game time with a with a club because they think you know they rate him they don't want to just sell him they rate him they think that you know he does have a possible pathway to get into the first team he's he's um he was training with the first team i remember being on uh, the tour um not, was it last year i think it was last year's tour he he was playing he was playing with the first team training with them he played a few games on that tour and he looked good and then i think he went on loan to lincoln because they wanted to get him on loan get him games and then he had a really bad injury that just took him out for the rest of the season and then he ended up coming back which was a real shame but there's a you know if you if you um speak to a lot of the uh coaches and people around uh, who watch that under 23 football regularly at Arsenal, they rate him just as highly as Eddie and Ketia. You know, they think he's, you know, they think he's a really, really good um, goal scorer. And um, I've, you know, he's a nice kid as well. I've met him a couple of times. And I think he, you know, that's a very, very good um, signing that you've got there. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a player, gets his head down, concentrates on what he's got to do. So he's, you know, you get some players, they go on loan, they sulk a bit. They're like, oh, what am I doing here? I should be at Arsenal. I should be, you know, knocking on the door the first thing. But I don't think he's that type of kid. I think he's the type of kid who's going to get his head down and want to impress there, really want to um, put in some impressive performances um, so that one day he can hopefully come back to Arsenal and uh, get into the first team. Because as I said, if you look at Arsenal, we're one of the very few teams in the Premier League that does give chance chances to young players. So if you look at the the current team at the moment, Eddie and Ketia is playing lots of first team football. You know, um, Ainsley Maitland Niles, lots of first team football. Uh, Saka, who also used to play with John Jules, um, is one of our best players at the moment. And um, I was disappointed that he didn't play the other night against Liverpool. He again come through the same ranks and as you know sees his opportunity when he's got that first team chance and he's now a regular in the team so the 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 opportunity is there for john jules if he goes and plays well for doncaster um and then he could hopefully then come back and try and get into that arsenal first team you know and you know if you if you've got a striker that's doing well saves the club a lot of money you know so um yeah so a hungry john jules is going to be good Doncaster because he's going to want to impress down there and if he impresses down there um you know that that only helps Arsenal the, th the thing I always think about it as well now with uh with young academy players is that they they look at their football career and they look on it they want it like if you're coming from Arsenal you want to make it into Arsenal's first team that's your ultimate dream yeah but you also want to be a professional footballer playing at the highest level. So if you go on loan and you do really, really well, even if you don't end up coming back to Arsenal and getting back into the first team, you can potentially get the move to another Premier League club. And there's been lots of Arsenal academy players that have got moves to other Premier League clubs or top championship clubs and stuff like that. And it's about their career, you know? So yeah, it's a massive opportunity for John Jules. And as I said, I think he'll be hungry. He's a lot of missed opportunity because of the, um, literally being out for a season with injury. Now he's got another bite at doing something. I think I think it's a very shrewd signing. Yeah, I think John Jules is really proving himself at the minute. And obviously you guys that are Donny fans will know he's been doing fantastically recently. So hopefully you can uh, continue that. Um... Here we go. This is going to be a big debate. Um, let's talk. Let's move aside a little bit away from Arsenal and Rovers. Let's talk about something that's been dominating the headlines in football recently, and that is, of course, this new handball rule um, involved with VAR. Now, the rules, you know, they've been there for you know over a hundred years. They've not been changed until VAR was introduced. And I think the big argument that's been going around football recently, and I think it's one big point to make. It's not VAR that's the problem, it's the people running it. And the handball rule's been changed 
add, it adds extra pressure to those defenders to play a specific way. And it just takes the excitement out of the game. And one big thing that I wanted to come across in this video was, would Dongster Rovers be a future Premier League team? And I want to look on that a little bit later in the, in the show. But sort of talking about this handball rule, it kind of makes me worry if Doncaster Rovers are going to be a Premier League team in the future with this this fluent attacking football that Darren Moore's bringing at the minute that's getting a bit of attention from the people uh, that's running the, the EFL on Quest show at the minute over recent weeks. Um, I do worry if Val's going to take the excitement out of Doncaster, which is something that's always been there. So, what, I mean, what do you think about this handball rule? And, you know, I've, I've watched the Spurs one back and even though they're a North London rival and you can't help but banter them, you do feel sorry for them because they've been outdone by a decision that should have been countered. Brighton against Man United was a penalty. Spurs wasn't. And I think Crystal Palace's Roy Hodgson can argue theirs wasn't as well. Um, I thought it was a great rule. <laughs> when, that, when that penalty was given against Spurs, I thought, fantastic. Yeah, I'm all for this rule, right? But seriously, it's uh, it's ridiculous. You know, that that one for Spurs, as much as I was, I have to admit, I was laughing my head off, right? Because, you know, in a game, it was typical Spurs, you know, Newcastle had no shots on target and still got a draw, right? So, um, but when I looked at it, even at the time, I was like, that's ridiculous. The guy's not even, it was Eric Dyer, he's not even looking in the direction. He's, he's jumping Somebody from behind him has headed the ball onto his hand. How he's can not that even be? looking at the ball. Like he's, 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 yeah, yeah, he's, he's, he's turned he's, away from the ball. But he's looking in the other direction. He's looking at the ball and it's gone over his head and the ball's been headed against his arm. What can he do about that? Absolutely, you know, and I don't know why this rule change has come in. Um, it used to be back in the day. Um, I, um, it had to be a deliberate handball and I think that's what it should be. You know what I mean? Because... If you start having it like it is now, you've got players that are skillful enough, you know, to kick the ball onto somebody's hand to win a penalty. They, you know what I mean? Somebody like a Kevin De Bruyne will easily be able to, to do that. You know what I mean? Somebody like a Pepe or a Bamiang who are very skillful players, they'll practice that in training, how to kick the ball against somebody's hand and make it look like a penalty. For me, what was wrong with what it was before? It has to be a deliberate handball. And that one was, wasn't deliberate. It was a complete accident. You know, I mean, he's not even looking at the ball. The one, the Palace one, same. That one, the penalty for me. And, you know, then you just start to, you start to wonder, what is a penalty? You don't even know no more. I mean, the, in the game against Liverpool, the goal that Jota scored, I thought that was handball. He's, gone, he's rolled down, he's slight control on his hand. To score the goal but it's given I, I honestly now at the moment the problem is that we do not know what is handball and what is not handball and that's what the big problem is not var i actually think var and i've said i've been trying, quite controversial on it before i actually think var is a good thing if it is run properly because you see so many i remember we played manchester united last season and we had a goal that was given offside that when you look back on it on the VAR, Aubameyang was a mile on side. It wasn't even close. And it was reverse. And when it works like that, there's still there's still a lot of tweaks and that that need to be made to made to VAR. But I think it is fairer to have VAR. But I just and I think people will eventually get used to VAR. But all these little other rule changes that they're doing in the background, and it's not really you can't even blame it on the referees. You can't really blame it. You know they get all the blame for it. But those decisions have come from like FIFA, UEFA. They come from very high up. They're the ones that change like the laws of the game. And then basically the referees have to implement it. And if they don't implement it, then they won't be able to referee games. They'll be, you know, so you can't even blame them. But it's absolutely ridiculous that, that those, the handball, what, you know, has to be a deliberate handball. End of. Just leave it at that. And try and get it right has to do with that. But if you get decisions like the one the other day, and we get, the problem is about it is there's more to come because this law is not going to change for now. I see that the Premier League are trying to lobby, I think it's uh, FIFA or UEFA, to change it. But I don't, from what I understood is there's no way they can, it can be changed until at least March next year or something. That's what I heard from somebody. Um, 
but it's not going to change for now, which means there's more of these incidents coming because you get in loads of games, you get the ball being kicked against somebody's hand in the box. And it's not a deliberate handball, but it's, you're going to see a lot of these given as penalties. I'd be, if, I'm a, if I'm a footballer, you know, if I'm a manager, in training, I'm getting my players to practice it. Kicking it against players' hands, right? It's a weapon. You know what I mean? It's not really right to do, but the rule is so ridiculous that I'd be like, yeah, learn how to do it because, you know, we can win a penalty a game out of it. Foolishness. I, I don't agree with it. And to be fair, it's one of the many reasons why I love that League One doesn't have things like VAR and goal line technology. But there's instances where that can come and jinx me. But we'll get to that bridge when we get to it. Um, and to be fair, just to extend on that, I mean, there was a couple of big talking points on the back of these decisions. And sort of get your thoughts on them. Um, Ex-players saying they want to get involved with the rules and help them get involved and help get involved with the game now they're not playing anymore. And Steve Bruce said it. Uh, Steve Bruce said it after the after the Spurs Newcastle game. He said that um, it was there to you know to help. Var was there to help. Var was there to you know be the logistical end to it. But it's gone way beyond that. And it's like Var's taking the assistant referee's job. It's taken the referee's job. And there was one big talking point with the referee because even though Var might not help the referees, uh, it's still being run sometimes by previous refs. And there's one big thing I've always said to people, and I don't think it's been discussed on YouTube at the minute. There's a reason why there's no English referees at international competitions like the World Cup, like the Champions League, like the Europa League. Because the refereeing in this country is not up to European standard. Yeah. Well, the referees, are, yeah, the referees, in the, I don't know about down in um, where you guys are playing. The referees in the Premier League are poor. Mm. That's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, they make some very poor decisions. Um, and I, as I said, I'm, I, I think VAR is a good thing. Yeah? As football moves on, as football evolves, as football gets quicker, the referees need help. And I think VAR is a good thing. It just needs refining. It just needs, you know I mean, some of the, you know, some of the offside bits need refining, to be a bit clearer. Um, but I think it is right that, you know, if a goal scored, you just do a, and the speed of it needs to be better. But I do think it's right if a goal scored, a quick check needs to be done just to make sure that it was a legal goal. I think, you know, there's so much at stake. I don't mind that. I just want it to be quicker. I want it to be quicker, you know. I want it to be done really quick. But I don't mind that because I think you have to have it now. If we're all watching it on TV. So sometimes there can be a clear mistake that is, you know, referees are human beings. And if the VAR aids and helps them out, like, for instance, we've seen this season, and this is where I'm saying where VAR is evolving, that the referees now are running over to the screen to double-check some of these decisions. For some weird reason last year, they weren't doing it. Everybody else in Europe were doing it. We weren't doing it here. Now, all of a sudden, in, with the introduction of that, they're getting more decisions right because somebody at the VAR place is saying to me, you know what, this is a hard one. You made the decision on the pitch. Go and check it. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. So if it's used right, I think in the long term, it's going to be a good thing. But, you know, um, and, and let's, let's be real, right? Even before VAR, there was a lot of bad decisions. That's what football's all about. There's lots of controversial decisions. There's lots of decisions we don't agree with. You know, I mean, it's always been like that. So, you know, and I think sometimes when you hear a lot of the ex-players moaning, they're thinking about it in their day. But things have changed a lot since since those times. And with the technology that exists in the world right now, I see nothing wrong with having VAR. But I just want it used better, more efficiently. And in that way, they'll be able to get the majority of the decisions right. Um, and, I, and I think, you know what, I think uh, they did a survey on it last year and it does get a lot more decisions right than what was previously done so that's a good thing but obviously because it's quite a new thing it's always going to stand out but the the handball thing which like you said right at the start is not a var thing it's absolutely ridiculous and that is something that needs to be changed with immediate effect yeah i definitely think that the handball rule is changing i mean down in league one like you were saying you didn't know about the refereeing quality 
there is some bad decisions in League One. Um, there was, I think there was a couple of things in back-to-back -back Donny Rovers games. I think uh, the referee for the Bristol Rovers game, I think we were on the attack about to score a fifth goal and they blew the final whistle and we were kind of like, I'm glad we won, but they could have at least played it on so we can get, make it 5-1. Let's get an extra couple of goals from the Charlton match. Um, but no, I think the refereeing quality needs improving and I think VAR is the right thing, but it needs to be you know, ran properly. I think I agree with you on that one. Um, so moving on then, uh, and you know, please download uh, the Flick app and get AFTV uh, on Flick because it's a it's a great app. I've downloaded it myself. I'm on that chat a few times when I've got time, so uh, I'm always there. And you know, if you want to do a poll on this, Robbie, feel free. As a little bit of an outsider poll, do you think Dunkster Rovers will be a Premier League team? Because you know, at the minute, we're craving Darren Moore's free-flow attacking football, playing out from the back. He's got the right positions, playing the right way and the right tactics. And, you know, like I said earlier, EFL on Quest, I was watching the highlights from the previous weekend. Colin Murray, Dean Ashton, Simon Grayson. They were starting to take note of Doncaster Rovers over these last couple of weeks and were finally give, giving, getting the notice that we deserve about potential promotion contenders. And people are, you know, calling us to say potentially we could be title contenders and go up to the championship. And I've always been optimistic as a fan. I've always said in the next 10, 15, 20 years, I want to see Rovers at least one season in Premier League football. And again, like I said, feel free to do a poll on this if you want, but can Dogster Rovers be a Premier League team? You've got a good, you've got a good manager. Um, you know, he'd done a great job at West Brom and it was unbelievable when they sacked him. Uh, I met him as well. Really nice guy. Really beautiful. <laughs> Tall, I tell you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm quite tall. I'm like six foot one. I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't realize I'm, that. Tall. I'm like six two, six three, so I'd be getting up there, but not the yeah, tallest yeah, down yeah. Well, <laughs> guy, man. But um, obviously, he, you know, he, um, it's good that he's back in management. And um, I, I thought he got treated really badly by West Brom because you know he did under terrible circumstances there. He did very, very well. And I'm really glad to see that he's back and doing well as well. And I think, you know, listen, he's a driven guy. He's very, very knowledgeable, um, you know, in football. Of course, he used to be at West Brom for years, you know what I mean, as a, as a real top player there. So you've got a good chance with him. Definitely got a good chance with him. Yeah, and I mean, it's... I mean, you got obviously you as Arsenal fans might not know about this, but you know we've been under you know really bad ownership back in the in in the late nineties when Bergkamp was flying and earning a hundred grand a week, and you know hundred grand hundred grand a week. That's you know our, our players don't even you know earn that now, and you know we were in an era where we were under a guy called Ken Richardson, and we were under the management of Mark Weaver and a Uruguayan striker. Uh, in the Spanish division, uh, top scorer in the Spanish division for a couple of seasons in the 60s as a coach called Danny Begara. And at that time, he had put all his financial assets into the club. He brought them back out. He decided to put no money into the club. He was charged with arson for burning down one of the stands or conspiracy to commit arson. And on the final day against Colchester, we were bang out of the league. We are going to have the worst record ever. If we didn't complete the fixture, the club might not cease to exist. We were having pitch invasions. We had a funeral procession on the way to the ground on the old Bellevue before it was demolished for the new stadium uh, back in 07. We had, we had we had so much negativity. We had Weaver having to leave the ground 20 minutes into the second half of that game because of his police safety, you know, out of his own safety because he said he wasn't going to go to the game. Then he came with a large group of minders. It was such a negative atmosphere. And then John Ryan came in, took the club up, brought us up. Uh, we beat Leeds in that playoff final, getting into the championship for the first time in 50 years. Uh, we've been teetering between League One, you know, for the last few years. We had one season in League Two, but that's because we were playing poorly with a poor squad and a poor tactic. Um, but like you said, we've got a fresh attacking intent. And, you know, under the current ball, we've got... A, I mean, obviously, you guys have your own opinions about Stan Kroenke, but our boards are the kind of boards... <laughs> um, our board is... You know, they don't sell us any BS. They always tell us exactly what's going on. They tell us, you know, about contracts, about transfers, and we'll get on about transfers a little bit towards the end uh, from both clubs' side of things. But, um, you know, they were very open and honest about the, the towards the fans. And I've said this in past videos. I mean, you guys have probably heard it on past videos. 
if we were in the Premier League, we could be an example as to how to run a football club to the likes of Newcastle, to the likes of West Ham, and to the extent of Arsenal sometimes. If they don't back a manager and they don't tell the fans what's going on at the right time, that's not the right way to run a football club. So could we be an example with this current board, um, with the right amount of backing that we've got at the minute? Could we be an example to the rest of the Premier League to say, hey, hang on a minute, this is how you run a football club and this is how you include the fans into the club? Because it... We don't feel like we're below the board. We feel like we're on the same level of the board. It's like a whole community at the minute. Well, that's fantastic. Um, you know, and what you described about your previous owner, you know, <laughs> Jesus, I thought Kroenke was bad. He said it doesn't even come nowhere near to that. I mean, the key to a successful football club is it needs to be run properly. Um, all the best football clubs, Liverpool at the moment, are doing so well because it's run very well from transfers to everything. It's run right. So if your club is run right, you've got a great chance of success. And it's as simple as that. Um, so with what you're describing there, how the clubs run, if, if the, that's how the fans feel towards the board, that's that's amazing because not you named out a few examples there, um, including Arsenal. I think Arsenal, the problem is, it's not so much that it's run badly, um, I think is I think sometimes at Arsenal there's been more the communication is an issue, um, and a lot of that's to do with the owner lives so far away in America, and he's one of these owners that stays pretty quiet. He doesn't really communicate with the fans, and that leads to a lot of resentment. And you've got all the pressures of the Premier League and the fact that we pay very high season ticket prices, and it was a club that was extremely successful for a very long time and we're going through um, a dip. But in anything you do, communication is the absolute key, especially when you're running a football club. And um, it sounds like the communication at Doncaster Rovers is good. It sounds like it's run well, and that is the key. Um, you know, the key component in a successful football club. And there's badly run clubs like Newcastle, like what you named out and stuff like that, where it's not run well and it's the communication is not good. So even sometimes when they're doing good things, nobody knows. <laughs> nobody really, you know, because they're not communicating it. So, um, yeah, I think you've got the ingredients there to, for success. By the sounds of that. Yeah, and it's, it's great to get that opinion from, from Premier League fans. And, you know, hopefully we can meet each other again in a league fixture. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's everything. So, Robbie, thank you again so, so much for uh, everything you do, first of all, for giving fans of Arsenal a voice. No worries, man. Thank you very much for having me. And good luck to Doncaster Rovers. Um, as I said, good luck to uh, John Jules. Um, really good kid. And I, I, I think he's going to do very well for you. And Darren Moore as well, great manager. I'll tell you, a really nice guy. And, um, you know, it would be, I'd really like to see him do well because, as I said, I thought he was treated pretty badly um, by West Brom after all the great things he did there. And, you know, for Doncaster Rovers to show faith in him and to, to give him a job, I, I think he will I think he will do something special. I, he's a really good manager, really, really good manager. So um, I think he's a, one of those managers who really motivates his players as well. They really like playing for him. So with and with the setup that you've described there, you know, you've got a great chance. You've got a great chance of doing something. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, potentially in a few years' time, I literally cannot wait to do a fan cam with you in a Premier League match at the Keymo Stadium. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. You've got a nice stadium there. I've seen your stadium before. And that's one of the stadiums I've never been to. So I'd love... I, I've been to a lot of um, stadiums, obviously, around the country. I'd love to come to that stadium. So, yeah, you know, you never know, man. Mate, it could even be this. It could be a, it could be a FA Cup. Game this year, you never know. But mind you, there's no fans, is there? I keep forgetting. Well, yeah, we'll have to do, we'll have to do a Zoom call fan cam instead. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, you know, it, it would be great. It would be great to um, to come up there. So yeah, you never know. Um, and yeah, and to be fair, if fans are back in the stadiums or not, I'd love to get you, DT troops, Ty, all of you on my channel to discuss a, a game against Rovers after the match as well. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Oh,